All right, welcome to Unit 4 on Probability, Random Variables, and Probability Distributions. This video is going to go over some examples for Topic 4.2, Estimating Probabilities Using Simulation. If you haven't watched the video over what this is, I'd highly recommend doing that first before we talk about some examples. All right, here's our first example. When a customer calls Apple for support of a product, Apple estimates that 18% of callers have to wait longer than nine minutes to talk to a representative. Apple conducted a simulation of 3,000 trials to estimate the probabilities that a certain number of callers out of 10 will have to wait longer than nine minutes to speak to a representative. The results of the simulation are shown below. So before we actually dive into the results of the simulation, what I want to make sure is you understand what Apple did. They know, based on, who knows, years of um, getting phone calls, that 18% of customers will wait longer than nine minutes. So the probability that any one customer has to wait longer than nine minutes is 18%. What they were looking at in this problem is how many callers out of 10 will have to wait longer than nine minutes. So if you think about it, if you have 10 callers, all 10 could wait longer than nine minutes or nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, or all the way down to none of the customers wait longer than um, nine minutes. So how would you actually go about conducting this simulation? I mean, I'm giving you the results, but we should be thinking about how was it conducted? Well, what they probably did was something like this. They used number 00 through 99. There are 100 numbers 00 through 99. And they probably assigned 00 through 17 to be the 18% of the 100 numbers that represent the phone call, takes over nine minutes to talk to representative. And then numbers 18 through 99 would be the 82% of um, you know, phone calls that are not over nine minutes. So this must have been their scheme, right? And then what they did was they looked at 10 numbers. They did not have to worry about numbers that nobody had because they're actually using every single double digit, double digit number possible. So there aren't any double digit numbers to ignore. You really don't have to ignore repeats here. The reason why you don't have to ignore repeats is we're not picking people. We're just using a number to represent what's happening to them. And what happens to one person should be completely independent of what happens to a second person. So I shouldn't have to ignore a number if it comes up a second time because that number is just telling me what's happening to this new person. So we're going to look at 10 different numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we're going to look at how many of them were 0, 0 through 17. Because if a number was 0, 0 through 17, that person had to wait longer than 9 minutes. So if you look at 10 numbers, maybe um, this person had to wait longer than 9 minutes and this person. So that trial would have two people that had to wait longer than 9 minutes. But they did that 3,000 times. So they looked at 10 numbers, looked at 10 numbers, looked at 10 numbers, looked at 10 numbers. And every time they looked at their 10 double-digit numbers, they had to identify how many of them waited longer than nine minutes. So instead of me asking you to do that, because that would take a long amount of time, I'm giving you the results. So here's the results of their 3,000 trials. Again, some trials had nobody that had to wait all the way to some trials that seven people out of 10 had to wait longer than nine minutes. Now, the first thing I noticed is that there is no eight, there is no nine, and there is no 10. And what that means is it must have been impossible. Mm, maybe not impossible, but of the 3,000 trials, no trial ever had eight, nine, or 10 people all having to wait. And the numbers in, these, um, um, in this histogram here are the probabilities, right? or the percentages. So for example, 18.1% of the trials actually did have zero people have to wait nine or more minutes, zero out of 10. 3.9% um, of the trials did uh, four callers have to wait, four out of 10, have to wait longer than nine minutes to talk to representative. So this is a really cool way of you not having to do the simulation, but me giving you the results of the simulation. So this is showing what could happen. And the nice thing here is you could see what's most likely. What's most likely is that only one person has to wait, one out of 10. That actually happened 34.5% of the time. Um, what was second most likely was two. 
And again, it was very, very rare, very rare for five, six, actually six never occurred in my trials. Um, seven, eight, nine, ten also never occurred. So once you have this um, output table to show you the output, the, 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 what happened at the end of the simulation, now we can ask you some questions. So the question actually is pretty simple. What is the probability that at most three callers will have to wait longer than nine minutes? All right, so if you got 10 people calling, 10 people about to call Apple, what's the probability that at most three of them will have to wait longer than nine minutes? Now, first off, you really need to understand what at most means. At most means three or less. It means at most three. So any trial that had three or less people have to wait longer is going to make me happy. So the probability that the number of callers is less than or equal to three, I'm using C for callers, less than or equal to three, at most three, is just simply going to be adding those four different options together. So we're going to go ahead and add 0.142 plus 0.284 plus 0.345 plus 0.181 and we get 0.952. So there's a very strong probability, a 95.2% chance that three or less out of 10 will have to wait longer than nine minutes. So that's good news. Um, obviously that's, you know, we do, nobody, I mean, we would prefer nobody wait that long, but inevitably it is going to happen to some people. So again, this problem is awesome because I need you to understand A, how they came up with all this data, and B, how we can actually use it to understand estimated probabilities. All right, next example. For a fair-sided die, the outcomes of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all equally likely. If a red die is rolled and a green die is rolled simultaneously, and the difference of the outcome, red minus green, is recorded, Okay, if we simulate this 500 times, what are the outcomes and which are most likely and least likely? So if we were to actually simulate this 500 times, again, what are we doing? We're going to drop two die, a red and a green, and we're going to look at the difference between the outcomes. What outcomes are most likely and what outcomes are least likely? All right, so let's start off by first off understanding what outcomes are even possible, right? So let's think we're going to do the red die minus the green die. Well, let's think about some options for the red and options for the green, and then we can actually create a list of differences. So, for example, the red, um, you know, the difference could be zero, right? The difference, red minus green, could be zero. But now we got to think, oh, man, how many different ways that can happen? Well, the only way you're going to get a difference of zero is if they're both the same. So that'd be 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2, 3 minus 3, 4 minus 4, 5 minus 5, or 6 minus 6. So there's actually six different ways that that can happen. Six different outcomes that would result in a difference of 0, red minus green. All right, but you know what? The difference could be 1, right? You know, red minus green could be 1. So now we got to think, all right, what would have to happen for red minus green to be 1? Well, um, for example, we could have, um, you know, I'm actually going to make a little line here so we could separate this. All right, well, we could have 6 minus 5, uh, 5 minus 4, uh, 4 minus 3, um, 3 minus 2, and 2 minus 1. So it looks like there are five different ways we could have a difference of 1. 6 minus 5, 5 minus 4, 4 minus 3, 3 minus 2, 2 minus 1. I can't do 1 minus 0 because the green die can't be 0. Um, so that makes sense, right? That's, that seems pretty easy. Okay. Um, the difference could also be 2. Well, that would be 6 minus 4, 5 minus 3, 4 minus 2. Can't do 2 minus 1. I'm sorry, I can't do 2 minus 0 because the green die can't be 0. So let's take a quick minute here and really think, are there any other outcomes that would result in red minus green to be 2? All right, I hope somebody is screaming 3 minus 1, right? Okay, I wanted you to kind of think there. So let's see here. So we have four different ways that we could have a difference of 2. All right, could we have a difference of 3? Well, let's see here, 6 minus 3, 5 minus 2, 4 minus 1. So there's three different outcomes that result in a difference of 3. 
All right, now I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to draw a little squiggly line, and we're going to do some more outcomes over here. Could the difference be 4? Well, that would have to be 6 minus 2. Okay. 5 minus 1. And is there any other way? I can't do 4 minus 0 because 4 minus you know, 0 is not even possible as an outcome on a die. So it looks like there's only two outcomes there. Uh, could the difference be 5? Well, I would have to do 6 minus 1. 6 minus 1 is the only way that the difference could be 5. It looks like there's only one way of that happening. Could the difference be 6? No, because the only way you could get 6 is 6 minus 0, and that's impossible to get a 0. All right, so it looks like I have a lot of differences that are possible here. I got a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then I have the outcomes, the number of outcomes listed here as well. Now, what else? Are there any other differences that are possible? Oh, yeah, I could have a negative one difference. If the red is 5 and the green is 6, 5 minus 6, or I could have a negative 2 difference, or a negative 3 difference, or a negative 4 difference, or a negative 5. Now, the good news is I shouldn't have to think about the differences because it would be the same. Like, if there's five different ways you could have a difference of 1, well, then there's going to be five different ways you could have a difference of negative 1 because it would just be all of these flipped around. Same thing for the other one. Four different, four different outcomes here, three different outcomes here, two different outcomes here, and one different outcome. So, you know, now that I have a true understanding of all the different outcomes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, now I can actually start to say, okay, how many different total outcomes are there? Well, let's add all these together, right? We've got 6 and 5, plus 4, plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, plus 5, plus 4, plus 3, plus 2, plus 1. So there are 36 different outcomes, right? 36 different outcomes. Now, six of them all result in a zero. Five of them all result in a one. Four of them all result in a two. Three of them all result in a three, and so forth. But there are 36 distinctly different outcomes when you start to think of everything that can happen, all the different possibilities. All right, so what is most likely? Well, the most likely difference is going to be zero. The most likely difference is going to be zero because that leads, right? There are six different outcomes more than any other that will result in a sum of zero, or I'm sorry, result in a difference of zero. So it looks like a difference of zero is most likely because it's six out of 36 are going to get me a zero. Now, then we got a bunch that are tied, like one and negative one have the same, uh, four and negative four have the same, three and negative three have the same, but what's least likely would be either an outcome of five, a difference of five, that's only going to happen one out of 36 times. Um, or a difference of negative five, that is also going to happen one out of 36 times. So what's most likely is you're going to get a difference of zero. What is um, least likely would be a difference of either five or negative five. They're both tied. But what I care most about this example is that, A, you understand, boy, i got to think about all the different outcomes, all the different things that could happen if I were to, you know, simulate this. And then we got to think about, you know, what's actually most likely to occur. And that's, you know, kind of a lot to do here, kind of a lot going on. So that's a really good problem. Hopefully, really, you thought through that one. All right, last problem, last example here. David knows from past history that he has a 70% chance of making a basket on a free throw. He wants to create a simulation to estimate the probability that he can make at least two baskets on his next five free throws. Explain the process if we want a random number table to be used. All right, now, again, one thing that David could do is actually literally actually start shooting, right? He could shoot five, and success is if he made at least two. Whoa, whoa, now let's be careful. What does at least two mean? Two or more. So if he makes two or three or four or five, he's going to be happy. So he could shoot five free throws and then record, am I happy? If he made two, three, or five, he's happy. That's going to get a check mark. That's going to get a success. If he only makes zero or one, well, that's not going to be happy. So he could actually do this, right, over and over and over again. And then again, the probability would be actually how many times he was successful divided by how many 
um, trials he ran. And then again, if you watch the video, you know that the true probability of this happening will be able to be determined in the long run if he were to do many, many, many trials. Well, if he were to do many, many, many trials, one thing that could happen is his arm gets tiled, tired. And then if his arm gets tired, then all of a sudden he might have a lower chance of making a shot. So how could we use numbers to actually pretend to do this? Well, let's see here. 70% would be 7 out of 10. So I could use numbers 0 through 9 because there are 10 numbers 0 through 9. I could use 0 through 6 to be the 70% because 0 through 6 are 7 numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 7 out of 10 is 70%. So those are going to be makes. Those are going to be makes. Okay? Makes. And then um, 7 through 9, those will be the misses. So those will be the 3 out of 10 numbers that are going to represent the 30% chance he misses his shots. So There's going to be misses. Okay, so then what I got to do is I got to look at 5 shots, 5 numbers. Okay? Now, I don't have to worry about numbers that nobody has because I'm using all single digit numbers. So I'm using literally every single digit number that's possible, zero through nine. I don't have to worry about ignoring repeats. Repeats are okay because again, every shot which is being mimicked by a number is independent of the next. So if I do get a six and then another six, well, each six just represents a bake. And the second make has nothing to do with the first make. So I don't have to worry about repeating or ignoring those numbers. All right, so then what I would actually have to do here is look at random numbers. I would look at one, two, three, four, five random numbers. And then I would simply count how many of them were makes. And it's successful if two or more of them are makes. So if only one or none of them are a make, well, then I'm not very happy. So these props are quite quite complicated. You have to first think about what numbers you're going to use, how you're going to use those numbers to represent your problem. Then you actually have to think about the fact that what do I actually want to find, right? I actually want to find the probability of at least two makes out of five. So I need five numbers to represent my five shots. That's going to be one trial. Every five numbers represents one trial and a successful trial is one that has two or more makes. So for me, that's going to be two or more zero through sixes. So as long as there's two or more zero through sixes, that's going to be successful. Otherwise, failure. And then maybe I'm going to run 100 trials and I'm going to count how many of them were deemed successful because there were two or more makes. And I'll put that number on top and boom, I got myself the answer to my question. What is the probability he makes at least two baskets out of the next five? All right, so notice that it didn't ask you to do it. It just asked you to explain how it would be done. But make sure your directions are very, very, very clear and well thought out. All right, one more follow-up question here. What would change if he had a 75% chance of making a basket? All right, what would change here is the numbers because no longer can I use single-digit numbers because there's no combination of single-digit numbers that represents 75%. 7 out of 10 is 70%. 8 out of 10 is 80%. I, I can't get 75% with single digit numbers. So what would I would have to change is I would have to use double digit numbers. 0, 0 through 99. There are 100 double digit numbers, 0, 0 through 99. 0, 0 through 74 would be the 75% of them that represent a make. 0, 0 through 74. Now notice I'm stopping at 74 because I'm using the 0, 0. So 0, 0 up to 74 is my 75% make. And then 75 through 99 would be the 25% chance or the 25 numbers out of 100 that represent a failure or a miss. So then I'm going to have to look at five double-digit numbers. So I'm going to need five double-digit numbers. And once again, success would be two or more makes. So I'm looking for two or more numbers to be 0, 0 through 74. If that happens, it's successful. Otherwise, it's failure. And I would repeat that process for many, many, many trials, count how many were successful, and that would be the estimated probability of that event occurring. All right, guys, hopefully these couple examples um, allowed you to logically think about how to run a simulation and what it all entails, and we'll get some more practice in class.